Hello and welcome to another Healthy Bite. My name is Dr. Ron Early. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, well, this week I invited back Dr. Christos Miliotison. Christos's background is um, he's a medical practitioner, but he is obviously very passionate about uh, biodynamics, regeneration, regenerative agriculture, soil technology, utilizing natural resources to draw carbon out of the atmosphere and solve climate, the climate uh, crisis. And I always enjoy talking to Christos because he has an open mind and uh, some great ideas, and uh, I think they're worth uh, sharing with you. Um, this is a theme that we explore on the podcast frequently. Uh, I would hope to have more focus in this coming year on on soil technology, particularly. And I note that coming up. In July, there is a regenerative agriculture conference up in Brisbane organised by Terry McCosker's uh, RCS group, which I'm hoping to attend, if not in person, certainly virtually, because there's a great uh, array of speakers. And one of those speakers is is Fred Provenza, who I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, on my podcast, talking about nourishment and getting the wisdom of animals' natural instincts about what to eat, learning from it and learning about primary nutrients and secondary nutrients within foods. And uh, he's just, I, I must invite Fred back on because it was such a wonderful talk, the uh, discussion that we had, and it was a wonderful book that he um, also published called Nourishment. And another another speaker, of course, is Charlie Massey, the author of uh the call of the reed warbler and one of the things that uh, I, I mean I've listen, heard Charlie Massey speak so often and, and I can't hear him often enough to be honest uh, he has the five cycles which uh, we need to focus on in regenerative agriculture well as a society really and those five cycles are the solar cycle which is uh, using uh, those solar panels that come with plants to capture the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and uh, move it into the soil. I mean, while Elon Elon Musk is offering uh, millions of dollars of rewards for solving the uh, carbon uh, carbon sequestration issue, uh, we, you and I, all know the answer to that because we studied it in first year high school and it's called photosynthesis. And Charlie Massey refers to that as the solar cycle. Then there is the water cycle, which is all about getting organic nutrients into the soil to make the soil more absorbent of water. I know one of our guests, Graham Reese, once said to me that when soil is dried and, dege- and, and degraded, it can sometimes take 5, 10, 15 or 20 minutes for uh, water to penetrate a few centimetres into the soil. And in the process, not only is water rolling off the land, but so is the soil. And so two really important resources are lost. But if the soil is rich in organic matter, uh, it takes somewhere between 10 and 30 seconds to absorb a few centimetres into the soil. So the water cycle is critically important because um, if we have organic matter within the soil, then we have a richer soil. And it's interesting also, while we're on the topic of soil, to mention that uh, when I was writing my book, I realised, I learned that it takes nature about 500 years to grow, to develop, to form one inch or two and a half centimetres of soil. So 500 years. Soil is a very important resource for many reasons, but to how long it takes to uh, grow soil or form soil is another important reason as to why it's an important resource. Uh, But in a well-managed regenerative farm where animals are used constructively, and I take you back to another guest, uh, Alan Savory, who said that uh, it is not the resource that's the problem, it's how the resource is managed. So many of 
us hear a repeated message of what a problem animal agriculture, industrial agriculture is, and therefore we should avoid eating meat. Well, you will know as a regular listener to this podcast that uh, that is not the view that we take. We've had a relationship with animals for millions of years, and so we should continue to have that relationship. But if a, a farm is well managed, and that means by rather than just leaving animals to graze in what's called a set stocking. So many of you would have driven along a road and seen paddocks that are huge and animals scattered over a wide area. That's called set stocking, where they're just left for months on end and slowly but surely denude the soil. And that's not a great way to be. Another way of doing it is with regenerative agriculture of tightly packed uh, uh, herds which are moved frequently from one paddock to another, allowing that area of soil to regenerate. You might not come back, bring animals back onto that patch for about two or three months. And in that time, they eat the soil, they eat the plants, they defecate, they urinate, they trample, they leave um, microbes from their urine, uh, which is all about uh, improving the soil. And, and uh, so a well-managed, and, and so they move stock around, and that's the big difference between set stocking and regenerative agriculture. Well, on a well-managed farm from regenerative agriculture, uh, soil, one inch or two and a half centimetres of soil can be grown in three to five years compared to 500 years. So that is a phenomenal potential and that is the water cycle about having organic matter within the soil. Another important uh, cycle that Charlie Massey talks about is the soil mineral cycle. And um, we've focused often on nutrient dense diets being important. And that is the key to, if you needed an overriding principle about what you should eat, um, the heading of it would be a nutrient dense diet. And a nutrient-dense diet includes some of the, fifth, you know, when we look at the periodic table, remember the periodic table in chemistry in high school, 118 um, elements. I think we might be up to 120 now, but anyway, 118 elements. Well, 50 or 60 of those elements are required for uh, the human body. And where do those elements come from? They come from the food that we eat. Now, you can grow food using fertilizer, superphosphate, potassium, nitrogen, phosphorus, and you can make plants look pretty impressive with those three or four elements. Um, and that would go to market and you would buy those plants, but they wouldn't necessarily have the 50 or 60 elements from the periodic table which we need and which would define a nutrient-dense diet. How do those minerals appear in the food? Well, we have a sim, uh, uh, an important relationship with bacteria, with microbes, with fungi, in the same way that we have learned that the relation, our relationship with microbes is critically important to human health in the oral cavity, in the gut, um, so important to have a healthy microbiome. Well, a soil microbiome is equally important because as carbon is sequestered from the atmosphere and brought down into the plant, converted into sugar and exchanged in the roots with the microbes. So there's this kind of um, exchange that goes on feeding the microbes, the sugars and the microbes and mycorrhizal fungi break down the minerals within the soil and pass that on to the plant, which we then eat or animals which we eat, eat. And so we end up with those elements. So the soil mineral cycle is a really important one. And, and with that uh, soil mineral cycle, well, with those microbes, uh, um, I, I remember Charlie Massey saying to me that, or hearing him say to an audience, that a teaspoon of healthy soil contains about a billion microbes and a cubic metre of healthy soil contains 27,000 kilometres of mycorrhizal fungi Hyphae, they are the fine hairs which extend from fungi through the soil, which literally break down minerals and make them available to a plant. Now, if a soil is, if fungicides, herbicide, pesticides and fertilizers are used, then the mycorrhizal fungi and the micro, microbes, the micro, microbial 
makeup of the soil is significantly degenerated and a lot less carbon is sequestered into the soil. So it's interesting to look at a soil profile of uh, one. I remember visiting a farm, uh, Robin Kate Milner, uh, not Robin, uh, yes, Robin Kate Milner. Uh, I remember visiting a farm uh, there and seeing the, the soil profile of where regenerative agriculture had been going on for some time. And, um, and, and it, you can see the darkness in the soil and where, where there is uh, the use of fertiliser, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, the depth of darkness might, uh, of the soil, which is carbon, is something like 12 inches, um, maybe. Uh, whereas in areas where regenerative agriculture has been going on for many years, that depth can be um, significantly deeper, running several feet. And so this is how we sequest carbon into the soil. So there we have the solar cycle, the water cycle, uh, well, solar cycle photosynthesis, the soil cycle involving bio, bio, biological material in the soil, uh, the soil mineral cycle uh, being about a healthy microbiome <clears throat> within the soil. And then the fourth cycle that Charlie Massey talks about is biodiversity of which he has obs had observed on his own property with the return of the uh, reed warbler, the call of the reed warbler, which apparently hadn't been in his Monaro property for 150 years. Uh, but because of a regenerative approach to agriculture, we have an increase in biodiversity. And this is diversity is a great, biodiversity is a great metaphor for resilience. Um, for example, in the mouth, in the gut. If you have uh, a, a broad, a, a diverse microbiome, you have a healthy microbiome and therefore you are more resilient to disease. Similarly, within uh, nature, the more biodiverse, uh, the more uh, diversity there is in terms of, of uh, flora and fauna, the healthier that environment is. So biodiversity is the fourth uh, cycle that Charlie Massey talks about. And the fifth cycle is arguably the most important cycle, which is the human social cycle, which is how farmers make their decisions and how we in the city as consumers can help them support those decisions. So the human social cycle is actually the cycle which, which ultimately will drive the change. And uh, it's fascinating for me to observe, I remember, I remember when we were up in Urala uh, several years ago before the pandemic, just at the height of the drought, visiting Tim Wright up on his, uh, I think his 4,000 acre property. And, um, and he, he uh, showed us around the property and we drove down a road where on one side of the property was his prop, on one side of the road was his property, which had lots of shrubs, lots of trees. Yes, it was at the height of the drought. The grass was brown but it was ground there was ground cover and literally on the other side of the road was just desolate uh, open a uh, bare ground that was uh, exposed there were a few animals grazing in the distance set stocking uh, tim's property was divided up the 4000 acres was divided up into 200 paddocks or something very tightly packed and, and so the contrast between the two was, was huge. And I kind of thought to myself, what is that farmer thinking when he looks across the road at Tim's property, a successful sheep and cattle farm, and says, what? And, and so the climate, presumably, is the same for both sides of the road. Well, actually, slightly differently, I would argue. But, but anyway, exposed to the same rainfall, if you like. And, and I wonder what is going on in that farmer's head? Why does he not think, well, what am I doing wrong? That his property looks so much more organically rich and resilient than my property. And that's an example of the human social cycle at the farm, at the farm, at the face there, at the coal face, if you like, of the farm or the farm face. Um, for, us, for us as consumers, it's the choices we make when we go shopping and how we support uh, those kind of farmers. And that's why I'm really proud to be a regular uh, user of Ubi out of our own backyard, the wonderful team run by Marat. Um, and I try to support 
uh, farmers, uh, and I've had the pleasure of visiting some of those farms in in, in um, New South Wales, specifically Justin Hartley and Duckfoot Farm and Phil Labor's at Moonacres Farms. And it was just uh, it's just such a privilege to support farmers like that in their endeavours. So Ubi is a, is a, um, a facility online ordering that we use at home, and I shop at my regenerative, you know, regenerative farm meets, you know, whether it's at Ethical Farmers, Dom O'Neill, or Grant Hilliard's at uh, Feather and Bone, which I believe is opening up very close to me here in Bronte, or Sam the Butcher, what, whatever um, I, I find, and, and Shira Lee through Ubi, you know, so there are lots of opportunities to support regenerative farmers and and the the meat that's grown so that is the human social uh, social cycle which is so important and one of the things that was really interesting was a slide that Christo, christos shared with us in this week's podcast where he showed a slide of a, a stretch of land which was probably no more than two meters uh, across and on one part of that was grass that was growing and it was very um it hadn't been mowed or anything like that and uh, the temperature in that in on that ground level was around 19 and a half degrees and then another patch of that grass had just been mowed and right next to it the temperature of the ground at that point was about 24 or 25 degrees and then right next to that was an exposed uh, there was no vegetation on this land on this part of it. And we're talking about a stretch that's no more than a metre wide. So within that small patch of grass, you could really see the difference that vegetation makes between the temperature of a gradient within that very small area from 19 degrees to 24 degrees where the grass was cut. This is at ground level and to the exposed uh, ground of 42 degrees, huge difference. So it was an opportunity this week to re-engage with this. I always find uh, Christos's uh, ideas really quite inspiring and uh, I love the way he uses materials, natural materials. And, and I thought that, uh, that, that one slide which was showing temperature at ground cover uh, is really quite a compelling thing. So it's always worth listening. I hope you, I hope you find it stimulating. I hope you, this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Early. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.